Welcome back to the second half of the Latinas Lead Power Summit, and thank you for your presence. My name is Lacey Galanka, Community Affairs Manager for Molson Coors, and it is an honor to be a title sponsor of the Latinas Lead Power Summit. At Molson Coors Beverage Company, we strive to be a leader in the beverage industry. We are steadfastly committed to putting people first, which means respecting and celebrating diversity. Our goal is to have a positive imprint on our employees, consumers, communities, and the environment. We believe in working to strengthen our communities, and that starts by providing educational, social, and economic opportunity, and building the next generation of leaders. That is why Molson Coors has been a proud partner with LCFC for a decade, supporting their One Community, One Legacy campaign and investing dollars in their programming to develop Latino leadership and strengthen Latino nonprofits throughout Colorado. We see these investments as having a long-lasting impact for generations to come. Speaking of generations, this year Coors Brewing will be celebrating a 150-year legacy of brewing the Coors family of brands locally in Golden, Colorado. As part of this, <laughs> yeah, this thank you. <laughs> As part of this monumental celebration, we are challenging individuals to start their legacy. We know this summit will provide you with strategies, connections, and opportunities needed to drive social change and create an environment where all Latino Coloradans will thrive. You get what you give, and we know Latinos, like those in attendance today, only give the best. So I challenge you to learn from each other and empower each other and legacy. Ooh, did we hear that? Start your legacy. That was the key, the key part of that speech there. <laughs> Didn't want you to miss it. All right. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Poderosa podcast panel. Latina podcasts have been on the rise and it's no surprise why. The diversity of Latinx stories need to be heard, celebrated, and amplified. Each podcast creates a virtual space where guests and listeners come together to share their experiences and insights. Today, we have gathered a group of inspiring Latina podcasters who are breaking barriers, challenging norms, and creating a new era of storytelling. They will deep dive into their journeys, exploring the inspiration and deciding moments that led them to start their podcasts. Now, I would like to welcome our moderator for today's Latina's Lead podcast, Poderosa's panel, Lori Lizarraga. Lori is an Ecuadorian Mexican American journalist and a Moroan Emmy Award winning broadcast news reporter. Lori's commitment to representation, social justice, and her Latinidad is evident in her role as a national co-host at NPR's Code Switch. Her reporting in 2021 sparked important changes in immigration coverage standards in numerous TV newsrooms across the nation, including Colorado. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our moderator, Lori Lizarraga, followed by this afternoon's distinguished panel. Thank you so much. Look at all of you. This is so exciting. I'm so happy to be here in person with all of you. This is the most beautiful audience I think I have ever seen. It's also the most Latinas I've ever had in one audience before. So I'm so happy to be here. Well, without further ado, let me introduce these amazing panelists who are going to be talking with us for the next hour. Starting with Tangia Renee Estrada, the host of That's What She Did a show about the women leaders, innovators, and rebels you don't already know but are totally worth knowing. With an emphasis on elevating the voices of women of color, that's what she did, amplifies the voices of those brilliant women. And then in the middle here, Diamond Garcia and Mireya Melendez are the hosts of Modern Latina Living. There's some fans here, you guys, some listeners. It's a podcast that explores the world of motherhood and entrepreneurship as these women are both moms and business owners. 
they share their ups and downs, their wins and fails, tips for balancing it all, and still having fun. They discuss everything from mindset shifts, breaking limiting beliefs, and the challenges of teaching kids while also being in the process of learning themselves. That is Diamond and Mireya. And then finally here on my left is May Ortega the host of Quien Are We. It's a podcast from Colorado Public Radio exploring what it means to be Latina, Hispanic, Chicana, or however you identify all of the above, maybe none of the above. May share stories about our wide ranging identities and the beautiful things that make us who we are. Let's give it up for the panel. <laughs> Okay, ladies, so I think I should start with engaging our audience a little bit here. Um, who here listens to podcasts? Ay, Dios mío. Wow, that's a really big portion of the audience. That's incredible. Is this like a new thing, or have you all been listening to podcasts for a really long time? Long time, new? Got a lot of this? Well, we are one of the fastest growing audiences in this podcast space, so it's incredible to see more and more of our faces and our voices representing the kind of work that we pitch, the kind of voice that we cover the stories with. So let me start by asking each of you now, how are Latinas occupying the space of podcasting? How do each of you occupy your space in a unique way, bringing a perspective that wasn't there before you got in your seat? May, we'll start with you. Hello. Hello. Hi, thank you for being here. This is cool. <laughs> I can feel the power in the room. It's great. Uh, so I am the host of Quien Are We from Colorado Public Radio. And the reason that we made our show really is because I identified that there's already not a lot of podcasts for our gente out there. Um, and one big thing, our show is focused on joy, right? Like Latino joy, sometimes like boring stories, which is my editor told me, don't call it that. <laughs> Don't call our show boring, but it's because I feel like in the media and in podcasting, we see, we hear these stories about white people that are just them living their life. Totally. And with our gente, it's always like they overcame so much or like their life was horrible. And those stories are very important and I enjoy them. But I also want to hear stories about like people like me, you know, they, thanks to my parents, I haven't had a very difficult life. My mom is watching the live stream right now. Hi, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of my parents, I haven't had a super difficult life. And so, but that doesn't mean that my story, your story, whoever's story, if you haven't struggled, that doesn't mean it's not worth telling in a larger way, right? Absolutely. So that's really the inspiration behind Gen Arley. Yeah. I love that. How yeah, I agree. That's the reason Mire and I started our podcast as well, is to share our story. I think we found that, one, we're already having these conversations. We want to share it with other women who may or may not be having these conversations, and also to inspire other women. I have come across so many young women and women of all ages that you know are stuck with their limiting beliefs, or you know they think they can't make it or do this or that for whatever circumstance because they're Latina, because they're moms, because they're this, and we really want just to inspire and motivate. Yeah, I think for me a lot of it was just not seeing a lot of people of our color, you know, and just speaking about just our daily lives and what we go through as Latinas and moms and entrepreneurs. And it's like how you mentioned before, there's a lot of, you know, white people and a lot of it I could not relate. And so that's why when me and her started, we're like, well, we already talk about, you know, so much stuff. We talk about books and we talk about, you know, manifesting and, and journaling. Everything. So I'm like, well, why are we doing it here? Why not just share it with the world? Um, so my story is slightly different. I didn't get into podcasting to tell my own story. I don't really talk about myself in podcasting at all. I got into po podcasting first and foremost because I wanted to learn how to podcast. And I thought the best way to figure that out is to just do a podcast. Um, and also because I was bored with everything that I was hearing out there in media. You know, um, to your point, I think it was May. A lot of the stories you hear are, are stories of trauma and strife and overcoming, and, and that has its place, and those, those stories are important to tell. I just wanted something different, and when I started podcasting in 2018, there was almost nothing out there. In 2018, only like, of all podcast creators and hosts, only 20% were women, and even the number was even fewer for uh, women of color. And I thought, I'll just do this podcast that's sort of like about interesting women of color that I want to hear about. And I didn't expect it to grow into what it grew into. I didn't expect it to become a platform. I didn't expect to start a business 
um, off of the strength of that by po podcast creators that was about empowering and creating a space for other creators of color. So it, it's not about me, it was just sort of about the, the need, the gap that was out there and just wanting to do something, anything really. I didn't think it was gonna become a thing, really. I had no designs of that. I just thought, I'm gonna do this one season and then I'm gonna go have a good idea for a podcast eventually, and here we are, so. Has it felt like? Absolutely, that's a great idea, May. We should clap for that. All of these women in their spaces doing what they do. <laughs> Has it felt like a burden at times to be like creating with this perspective of you not only you know, create with your, with your own experiences, hoping to elevate other Latinas experiences, but there's also a pressure to succeed, right? And, and it almost puts the, the pressure on in the audience. They have to consume and engage with the content. And so it, it almost becomes like, does it become work or, or pressure in any way? Or how do, how do you make sure that it doesn't? I don't think so. I mean, we have yeah. fun. We, For us, we started it fun. Yeah, and we continued that. And we never, like how she said, we didn't expect to ever at least I know I didn't expect to be here. Um, we just kind of decided to do it. We just went for it, and we still have fun doing it. And yeah, know, we don't have we don't feel any pressure. I mean, none. we went three months without posting an episode because <laughs> we were busy with our lives. You know, we get busy. She has three kids. I'm a single mom. We work full time. We have our businesses. So it's like we will get it out when we get it out, and we're having fun in the meantime. And um, you know, we're super grateful to be here and share. Absolutely. I feel pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but with the caveat, like, I don't feel pressure to create the podcast. That's something that I do um, because it is an enjoyable experience. It's, granted, it's a ton of work, um, so d don't be confused about that. It sounds easy. It's not. Um, but I think on the, on the other side, on the BIPOC podcast creator side, yeah, I feel a lot of pressure because we've, we've built a community there of creators who came together because, because of these reasons, right? There wasn't a lot out there for us. There, there weren't a, a lot of professional development opportunities for creators of color. There wasn't access. There were all these problems in the industry that happen in any industry, particularly media. And so we moved with BIPOC podcast creators to try to solve that. So I feel the pressure from the community who is waiting for us to like, what is the next thing that you're gonna do so that we can join you in that and get to the next level? Because at, at its core, that's about power building for, for our folks. And I, have, I take a, a serious responsibility there when I say, okay, we're gonna build power together in the media industry. And that's not an easy thing to do. So I feel pressure every freaking day. Um, that I'm trying to run a business and we have contractors to pay and we have responsibilities So there's that side, but I feel the pressure that's probably self-imposed from our community of creators I wonder if that sounds familiar to anyone in the audience. <laughs> Self-imposed -impl pressure. Hmm. So yeah <laughs> um, Yeah, I feel some pressure too. It's different from that, but that sounds terrifying <laughs> <laughs> Not to say I don't think our show has not built a community, but I think the pressure that I feel when we're making our show, and I say we because we're a team of like six people, mm -hmm. and um, because I feel pressure in telling the stories of the people who are trusting us with their stories to tell that correctly mm -hmm. um, in a way that's respectful to them. Because a lot of these people, we, you know, we could have celebrities on the show, but I didn't want that. I want, again, to tell normal people's stories that are inspiring, but again, not in the, oh my God, it was so hard. Sometimes it is. Sometimes their stories, you know, all of our stories come with some strife, but a lot of people have never told their story before. And I always tell them, you know, I'll prep them ahead of time with a few interviews ahead of time, all this stuff. And I'll tell them, no one knows how to tell your story better than you do. Yeah. Um, and you know, since it's recorded, it's like, if you mess up, if you want to reword something, just stop, start again, you know? And so I think there's that pressure for me and for our team that we are doing justice to this really important, unique story that, you know, we're being trusted with from, by someone who doesn't really know what's going on on the back end yeah. until it's out, really. Um, yeah, that's first and foremost the most pressure that I feel when we're making ours. Do you ever feel pressures from, like, you're working at CPR? I imagine that the Latino population at CPR is not, like, the predominant demographic. No, definitely not. Um, <laughs> and so, it, you know, it isn't at NPR either, and I'm yeah. unfortunate enough to work on a, sh on a show on a team that is a race and identity team, so it is a really diverse team, but that is not, that's not the norm at NPR. So, I guess my question is, does, is there also an added pressure to try to 
do a show that is for your people, but the people who are like green lighting the work and the content and the yes on the show don't have the same perspective that you're trying to represent? That is something that I was very nervous about when we were first starting the show because if you listen to public radio in any form, you also know it's very white. Um, and in our newsroom, our first season, the two people at the very top of our podcasting wing are white. The one in charge is a white man and a white woman. And then, but everyone else who was in the trenches with me is Latino and all kinds, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican, like ev we're, we're trying to have that kind of diversity, which helped take off, you know, I was trepidatious about that. Like, okay, well, but the person who has a final say is a white man, is he gonna get this? And so when they agreed to, you know, when they greenlit the show, I made it very clear, I respect you, I like you, but this is our show and I hope you understand, like you will take our opinions you know, you will weigh those, that will have a lot of weight. And we have been very lucky in that CPR has been very like hands off, you know, generally there'll be like story structure, but not about the things that matter. It's yeah, it's giving guidance, but mm. not telling us what to do, which I think is very important. Yeah. And that might be a really different answer, a really different perspective from all of you, depending on, you know, speaking from the public radio side, what, what is that like for, for you all? The dynamics are so weird in media, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're so strange and there's, there's, podcasting is, is, is a niche within the media ecosystem, That's right. which makes it even weirder. Yeah. You know, as we, where we sit right now, podcasting is about a $23 billion industry in the next seven years, it's expected to expand to around 130 billion. So the opportunity is there. And what's strange about it is people love to say that podcasting doesn't have gatekeepers because there's a low barrier of entry. Like you could, you could get a mic and you can record on your phone and you can post it on the internet and bam, you have a podcast, right? But that's not actually true. Which, by the way, if you ask my siblings, they, would, they say it every time they're in a conversation that nobody else would get but them. They're like, we need to record this. We would have the funniest podcast. I'm like, no, you would not. Nobody wants to listen nobody to, wants to, listen this, to incoherent, <laughs> this incoherent conversation. I hope they're watching, too, because I, I mean that. <laughs> that part is true. That, that part is absolutely true. But so because of that sort of easier barrier of entry, people think, oh, there's no gatekeepers in podcasting. Like I can go in there and I can just build this amazing business and we're just gonna make so much money. Uh, no, no, no. Anywhere there is an opportunity for money to be made, there are gatekeepers. There is somebody standing somewhere in an office and they're like, not coming down this lane, not you. Not you, not you. You have to make the path for yourself. And if you come into podcasting like most people have historically done, which was like sort of stumbling into it like we kind of did for the most part, then you don't know who the power players are. You don't know how the industry works. You don't know where the money comes from. You have to figure it out for yourself. And that makes your path longer and harder and steeper than the gatekeeper's path. So that's what I have to say about that. Woo. <laughs> and that, that's not just an experience that people can relate to through this experience of podcasting, right? I mean, insert industry, insert career, insert job title. And I feel like there is something relatable there for all of us in what, wherever, you know, whatever seat you sit in, whatever job title yours is. So I'm glad that you, you mentioned it because it's true. Anything from Diamond, Mireya? I mean, I'm learning so much from both of you. So I didn't understand. <laughs> I mean, we just started this at the beginning of the year, and I'm like, I didn't realize there was gatekeeper, gatekeepers, and like, I'm like, we're just, we're I mean, our own bosses. We feel no pressure. We're having fun. Fair. We didn't realize there was like, <laughs> never come across that. You know, we it might really not. Depends what you're trying to do, and that's I'd say that's another great thing about podcasting is you can go out and you can create your own little ecosystem, and you can make money off of it, and you can build a platform. But as you try to grow, and you're and you, like maybe you get to a stage and you're like, how do I sell this show? You're gonna start to see the, the gatekeepers. You're gonna be like, well, what do I do, and how do I do that? And, and so that's one thing that we we're trying to figure out with BIPOC podcast creators is creating those bridges so that we can say, here's a really great content creator, somebody that's like just killing it, but you Spotify or you Apple, you Wondery, you don't know who they are and I'm gonna show you who they are because you should be paying them, right? Mm -hmm. But then that, there's all kinds of pitfalls with that because again, you're selling to the media 
And to be fair, if, you, if that's not your path and you don't want to do that, great, don't do that. Do what you're doing. Build your show. Build your own platform. Monetize it in your way, which is what every independent creator should be doing. And you can build a business around it. And I think what's cool about this particular slice of media in podcasting is that I think this panel represents a really good diverse group of women who are doing it differently. These two with Modern Latina Living, it's so unique to have like all of this, these perspectives on stage because what I love about Latina so much is that we want to share our experiences, we want to have conversations with each other, we want to give each other advice. Sometimes we like to hit each other over the head with it, mama. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, are, we, are, we do like to pass down information and lessons learned, right? Wisdom, experiences. We like to help each other and teach each other. And it's hard because we're not always in community with each other as often as we would like to be. It's hard to get a group of women that have this many Latinas and to be able to see your person across the room and be like, Ay, there's one of mine. I have a friend. I want to go talk to her and meet her. It's often you feel like you are the only in the room. So what's, I think, special about podcasting is that we want to be creators, right? who give our voices and lend our wisdom and our experiences to what stories you're hearing and what other voices in our communities are being elevated. In that same way, we can choose on podcasting to elevate our own voices and our own experiences. So we're each coming at it in such different ways. That's also a really just like special highlight. That is not a question, but more me just voicing how proud I am of all of you. Um, <laughs> are you gonna cry? And that's me sharing my wisdom and hitting you over the head with it. Um, okay, so. I guess you were mentioning this, I think, May, about you know, your, your power and how you see yourself. And I think all of you have sort of like talked a little bit about this, but I guess I want to ask each of you to describe how you each see your own power. Like, how do you describe it? Especially in this space where so many Latinas are, I'm curious how much of us we will see in each other by these descriptive words, because I don't know that if I asked a different room this or a different set of panelists this, I just don't know what like the answers would be. So I'm really curious how you see your power and why you are such a strong creator in a space that, like you say, um, Tangia is not is not looking for you necessarily to succeed every single time. There is a reason that there's a deficit of us in this space when we represent such a huge part of the population. So how do you, how do you see your power? How do you describe it? I think for me, it's just letting me know that I have this kind of power to begin with. I don't know, I, that might sound a little like, no. you know, I don't believe in myself or no. something, but um, I don't know, it just, when we started, the reason, okay, so the inception of Quien Are We happened in the newsroom because we had a Latino audience engagement committee and we were like, how can we reach the Latinos of Colorado? Because again, public media is not great at reaching people of color. First thing we could do was a podcast, you know, all this They're stuff. Like, they really like immigration? Yeah. Something? Oh my gosh. And I was like, can we not do something like, political, please? <laughs> um, so, you know, and we ultimately, that's how the show came to be. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay, this will be a show that we're making just to see how it goes. But we hear from people, even backstage, there was a woman who was like, I love your podcast. The other day, I even like white people will come up to me and say that they like oh, yeah. the show, which is very interesting to me because yeah. it's not for them. Hell yeah, we're uh, interested. <laughs> I think it's because of the same NPR uh, um, format, yes. Out here. Yes. which I love. That was yeah. like meshing both of them. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so we've had all kinds of people kind of be like, I love listening to this. And so I feel that my power comes from giving other people power. Oh, and I'm awesome. not one to say that like giving a voice to the voiceless is a very common phrase. A lot of people say it. Everyone has a voice. It's just you're kind of giving like a megaphone totally. to those people that you're featuring on your show, to yourself or whoever it may be. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, what about you, I would say that I think I always believed in my power. I had a very um, encouraging mom. Um, from the beginning, uh, which was funny because I think about it and she's like, you can do this, you can do that. And then something, she's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> like I couldn't walk to the park by myself or a couple years ago uh, when I was in my early 20s, not a couple years ago, a while ago, um, <laughs> I drove to Colorado Springs and she's like, you drove by yourself? Um, yeah, mom, I can drive an hour away. It's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Good job. You did it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then in the, the last few years, um, and I think part of the reason we, the conversations we have in the podcast is like stepping into your power and like aligning with your higher self and your divine feminine and really like owning that power. Um, and that comes with me believing that my power is um, endless, limitless, and potential, like fully has endless potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. 
Uh, so for me, it was a little bit different. Um, totally complete, like different childhoods. And so I think right there, like how she was always, you know, I could do it. I have this mentality of like, whatever I go for, like I can, I can do it. And mine was always like, you know, I was always in fear and always just like, no, I shouldn't do this. What do people think of me? You know, what if I, I every, everything was always think about what other people are going to think of me. And then it just, you know, one day it was like a switch and I'm like, okay, this isn't right. Diamond, like made me see that, you know, she saw the, that I, that I was worthy and I didn't see that in me. And so it kind of helped with, you know, my husband, um, having his podcast and then just telling me, Hey, you want to start a podcast, which was going to start as an organizing, but I'm like, I can't just talk about organizing for like 30 minutes. I'm like, I want to talk about, you know, all kinds of things. And then we started to really realize that oh, I think my mic's going in and out. <laughs> Is that no? Okay. Um, so I just, I realized, you know, I had a lot of healing to do yeah. and I was like, I, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that had childhood trauma that didn't have a good relationship with their mom. <laughs> Thank you. You guys make me cry. We said we're going to cry after the show. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just realized, you know, there's a, there's a lot of us out there that are dealing with all this and that we're all healing. And so I'm like, why not start a podcast where we can just share this and just build a community? you know, beautiful Latina women, you know, are just amazing, and you want, you know, like, we all want to do great things, and, and not let all of our childhood traumas define us. Yeah, that's <laughs> Oh, God, I think power is such a tricky conversation, um, whether we're talking about external or internal power, and the, the truth is, is I struggle a lot. You know, growing up, I was, I have a huge family, but it was really the women in my family that raised me. Uh, you know, I was brought up by really strong brown and black women who were just handling shit. Whatever it was, they got it done, they didn't complain, they sucked it up, they figured it out, and they kept on moving. And that example is very powerful to watch, but it's also a thing that you can internalize where there were no like real conversations about power, what it meant to be a woman or a woman of color in the world and how you navigate yourself. It was just figure it out. And so I, I can't say as an adult that I do anything because I feel powerful. I do think, I, I often don't. I do things because like, what the hell else am I gonna do? Like, I'm gonna hang that's out? That's the like, mentality. <laughs> that's the mentality of a lot of Latinas, yeah? And so I just, I do the things that I feel compelled to do and I hope that it works out and I, I don't think I'm doing something powerful. I don't necessarily think I'm setting an example for anybody. I'm just trying to figure out life like everybody else. And if it works out, great. And sometimes I feel really great about it. But a lot of the time I feel like, you know, maybe I'm not the one. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be leading this company. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this podcast. Maybe I shouldn't be doing these, these conversations. But again, what is the alternative? I'm gonna like pack up all my shit and go home and watch TV all day? Like, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> I have bills to pay. And, and you know, I think that as you evolve as, as a woman and grow, your concept of power changes. And it's, it's very different to me now than it was five years ago. Like I have a two-year-old now. And this is coming from somebody that never intended to have children, ever, ever, ever. And it was absolutely an accident. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> so, so, so here we are. And now my understanding of power is evolving more, right? Because now, now I really am in charge of this tiny human that looks to me for everything. And so what is, what is he going to see? And, and what me standing up for myself or doing whatever it is I'm gonna do in the world, what is he observing and, and what does that mean to him um, as a, a little boy who's gonna grow into a young man and then be a man. And so I think of power much differently now. And, and so it's much more starting to turn internally and saying, how do I show up as the best me? Whereas before I was very concerned of like, I just gotta do the thing. Like whatever the thing is, I gotta get it done so I could do the next thing. and that was what power meant to me somehow in a very strange way. 
and I think it just evolves over time, and I still struggle all the time. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Same. This one got y'all. I felt there were lots of nods, hands on hearts. But I mean, that's what makes us, us being in these spaces, talking about this, even just this panel, because this is not like these, these are the conversations that we're having necessarily even on any of our shows. But it is what makes it so powerful to have Latinas in the room sharing these experiences, having our voices on these shows, because as much healing as we're doing, when we voice the stories that we're doing, that we're having the conversations on the shows that we're having, it's also incredibly healing to, to have a shared experience with someone who is creating that, that product, to, to hear yourself in somebody's story, to hear yourself on the radio, in a podcast. My gosh, to pause this because this is so much like me. Who is this person? I've never heard myself in something. So much. The, the fact that that happens so rarely for us is, is sad. It's somebody else's everyday reality. Like, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. They see themselves in everything. They see themselves seen all the time. They almost don't even know what it's like to not have that. So for us, those moments really like glow and they mean something. The more of us that are in these spaces, the more that we start to heal ourselves being in these roles and empower our own selves and see our own power. Um, but we also elevate each, each other, just being able to, to share the stories and, and give a space for you to latch onto something and say, oh, that's, that's me. That's really, really important to have those moments. And every single part of what you, you all are talking about it does translate into the shows that you're creating, which is just so in incredible. It makes me so excited for the next iteration of, of what you know, we'll create in this space. Um, what work or sound or you know, story voice um, have you told on the show, on one of your episodes, um, that makes you feel like it's creating space for Latinas, especially like in Colorado specifically, to feel seen, heard, understood, to have one of those moments where they're like, oh, that's me. Is there any like character, story, episode, subject that has like, you know, that you've worked on that you're really like, oh, this is, this is one that I know would not have, have been created if I were not here, if this perspective were not in the room, and this is one that I, I felt seen by or I really felt like other Latinas could be seen by. Yeah, I immediately thought of one. You okay. finished asking it, and I was like, oh, I know who it is. Good, it is good. the last episode of our first season, and it's called The Mother. Um, and it's about a woman, an acquaintance of mine from college named Demetra, and she is amazing. Like, she, you and her are, like, of the same, like, cloth. Oh, You're, like, on it, go get her, like, kind of real fashionable and everything. <laughs> oh, me, oh, my God. I'm and, like, uh, and what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep going. <laughs> Forget the question. <laughs> And uh, so Demetra was born to a single teenage mother in Chicago um, in like the Trumbull neighborhood, if anyone is familiar with that. And it's apparently not a great part of uh, the city. Um, so she was born to the single girl. The girl hadn't even told her, her parents. Oops, she hadn't even told her parents that she was pregnant or anything. The baby daddy dipped. Um, so she goes, she's at a friend's house. She goes into labor. The friend and the mom take her to the hospital. She gives birth. She says, I don't want to keep this child. I can't do this. The mother of the friend was there, and the mother was already, like, in her 50s. Her youngest child, she had, like, six. Her youngest child was already, like, 16. Um, she was done having kids, but she said, if I don't step in here, this child will go into the foster system, and she, it'll, she won't have, you know, her chance to succeed will be reduced significantly. So she adopted her. The whole point of the episode is Demetra, because of her age gap with her mother, there's a language barrier as well. Her mother, you know, was undocumented, only spoke Spanish, like worked her whole life. So she didn't get to spend time with Demetra because she had to keep working and working to provide for this family. So, you know, they had a very strained relationship. They didn't really understand each other emotionally or, you know, uh, language wise. Now, Demetra is, um, she had a child of her own a few years ago. I think he just, he's about to turn two. Um, and she, the episode is about how her strange relationship with her adoptive mother, never knowing her birth mother, she has never met her, knows, knows nothing about her, um, how that impacts her own mothering with her son. Um, and it's just very interesting. It was a really, really great interview to have. We actually had to do two interviews. Usually we'll just do the one, mm -hmm. but this one, there were so many things once we were writing the episode and putting it together that we were like, we need to dive in deeper to this. And the second interview, she cried and she told me, you know, something that she had never admitted to publicly is that she had a miscarriage after she had already announced the pregnancy and like all this stuff. And this is all in the episode. Um, but yeah, and afterwards, um, you know, the episode premieres, 
she reaches out to me and she's like, hey, you told my story so well, thank you, all this stuff. Hearing my own story, being, you know, hearing it from myself in a way I've never told it, um, has encouraged me, one, to go to therapy to address yeah. all of this trauma <laughs> that I never, you know, thought I had to address. Yeah. And also I've started looking for my birth mother. Aww. So yeah, and I'm just kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't relate to any of that. I don't have kids. I don't think I'm adopted. <laughs> Mommy, am I adopted? <laughs> And, uh, and so I can't relate to her in that way, but we are both Latinas and you, you've listened to, you said yeah. that you've listened mm -hmm. to it. You can tell we, there's an understanding there just because of the minimal, not minimal, but the one thing we have in common 100%. is that we are both Latinas and we're both from Texas. That's it, but that's enough 100%. to like get us to find commonality mm -hmm. and for her to open up to me and trust me with this very important story. And it's a great story. <laughs> I did not know that she was, or so are you going to do a follow-up now? I don't, well, it, we're in preparation for the second season. Now we're doing a fatherhood episode for oh, this one. Okay. So it'll be interesting. That's yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Simon Medea. <laughs> um, one that stands out uh, was uh, we talked about religious trauma. Um, that one kind of hits Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> a lot of you in the audience, audience out here. Like, everybody <laughs> got hit. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, we talk about it. We dive. We dive pretty deep in the episode. We had to split it up into two. Um, you know, just talking about how. Um, it has affected our life in adulthood and you know finally being able to find ourselves and be spiritual and actually be able to I had a I just started a new job and my coworker asked she goes are you Catholic and I said no and she kind of looked at me and I said no I'm spiritual and I feel like now where we can say that more openly mm -hmm. because back then it was like you know you had, it, it, esas son cosas del diablo and this and that, you know, it was just like, you couldn't say that. And now I feel like, you know, there's more people who, who associate themselves or, or not associate, but just, you know, they're more, you're more spiritual. And, um, you know, I wanted to bring that to the forefront because there is more of us now. And, you know, that's a, that's something that a lot of us are still uh, healing from, or many of us don't even know. Um, so yeah, I think that one right there. That's yes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I think it was in that episode where we were talking about her upbringing, and then I was also bringing in my mom's story, and she was like, "I see so much of myself in your mom," and I was, I was thinking the same thing. We're like, <laughs> you have very similar stories, like very similar upbringings and moms, and where you know it's a different generation but they're still going through some of the same things so yeah. i love that i also brought my mom onto the podcast and interviewed her so it was really great that she was able to experience that but then we're also able to share intergenerationally um and connect in that way that our stories all connect yeah, yeah. that's beautiful What's the, so on that's what she did podcast every season we do a different theme and so i'm, I'm talking to you women from all over the country, sometimes in other countries. But I make a point every season to save space on the podcast for women from Colorado, because I want to make sure those stories get told. Um, and there's probably two that really stand out to me. There was one, that, an episode that I did early in the podcast when I was still sort of finding my way and trying to figure out, you know, what is this podcast ex exactly? Is I had a couple of friends on. We just sort of like talked about like, what's happening in your life and I remember like ending it and then walking away from that conversation and being really proud mm -hmm. and being like I know some badass chicks like that's that's amazing and then and also realizing like I have friends <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's not just me out here feeling like I'm all isolated and alone in the world you know just keeping it pushing like I was I was raised to do and I, I walked by being like they like me <laughs> like, I have really cool friends and if they're cool I'm probably a little bit cool too so, so that was great <laughs> and then the other one that really stands out to me is I did I actually ended up doing a follow-up of this um, and it's called race to dinner I did it it was a few years ago now um, but it was with two women from Colorado who are running this business called Race to Dinner. And they've since then, they've released a book. They've been on a national tour at this point. And basically what they do is a, it's an a East Indian woman. I believe she's from Virginia, but she lives in Colorado now. And a black woman who's from Colorado originally. 
from Denver. They go around and they get, they have these conversations over dinner with white women confronting their racism. And I was just like floored <laughs> when, when we first had this conversation. Cause I'm, I'm also like losing my mind because this is something that I want to do a story on also. So I have so many things to talk to you about after this. Let's do it. <laughs> So they, they go around and, and they, this is not a nonprofit, this is a business. These yeah. white women pay them a lot of money, a thousands of, money. of dollars, a to sit down money. and have, have dinner with them so that they can tell them that they're racist. And then they can argue about whether or not these white women are racist. It's fascinating, <laughs> fascinating. And I've real never real been real. like sitting in an interview with like my jaw on the floor being, being like, like they pay you, they pay you? <laughs> They were like, oh yeah, like we're not doing, we're not giving them our time for free. Are you crazy? I'm like, absolutely not. Don't give them your time for free. And it's since then it has turned into this amazing thing where they're traveling around the country. They have a book deal. The book came out, I think, last year. They've been on like GMA. They've been on Dr. Phil. They're they're doing the whole thing, and it's a, such a unique and in your face approach to attacking racism and being like, I am going to confront you on your white privilege and I'm gonna make you see it even though you're gonna sit here and you're gonna argue with me. You showed up here knowing that I was gonna confront you on your racism and you're still gonna argue with me that you're not racist. Like how racist do you have to be to be like <laughs> I'm like sweating. I'm sweating for them. I'm not even there. I'm like, it's amazing. Oh my God. This is so stressful. And we, and so, you know, I'm trying to, now that they're like, once they're done with their tour and everything, I hope to get them on for a follow up to see like, what are the, the results? Like, give me the data. What actually happened? Um, conversations like that, I think, are so impactful to be able to be like, look what these women are doing. Look how innovative they are. And they're just two women that were friends that live in Denver and we're like, well, what if, what if we like talk to white women about their racism and see how that went? <laughs> what if we did that? <laughs> I mean, it's like religious trauma conversations. Like we don't talk about Bruno. Like, why, like it's the same, same thing. It's fascinating. They probably ran into some white women, had that conversation and were like, we should start recording this. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh my God. And a great reminder, by the way, um, how we should be constantly thinking of how to capitalize on what is otherwise just like your trauma or your experience or like <laughs> yes. the things that we're, it's really, really easy, right, to compare ourselves to our white counterparts and say, like, in comparison to you, I have this, this, and this that's less than you or less experience, less money, less this, less that. Knowing that you come from that, that experience is also value. Somebody's opposite is not like your less. It, it, it is what you bring to the table that they don't have. And that is a really, really good reminder. I'm not saying every one of us should go out and like, start having dinners <laughs> that we charge our white friends to come oh, to. No. <laughs> and then I was going to go to Target after this and just pick someone. <laughs> some goodie guys? <laughs> don't pick up some goodie. Get in, girls. <laughs> I'm, not saying that. Dinner I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. If you do, go call us because we're going to make a podcast out of it. <laughs> Um, but that is to say that there are so there are so many ways, right, to like plug that in, that mentality into thinking of like what do I have, what does it bring to the table, where does it fill in the gaps that other people in the room don't have. That's that's the way they were thinking. They weren't looking at what they didn't have. They were like, here here's what I have, here's what you lack. Let me make some. Y'all want two hundred fifty dollars a plate? Let's go, getting us sign up. And then they started to, I guess. So and I think that's like stepping into their power too. It is and then charging for it plus tax. <laughs> It is though, and that's like that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow, love that. Um, what is the benefit of the show that you each work on, and what is the benefit of having you host host it? Um, so for mine, again, it's just telling normal. Like I could pick someone from here, and just I'll interview you for the podcast. You know, there's something interesting about your life, a hobby, your job, whatever. Like all three of you, I could have a whole episode about each of you because you're interesting. Um, and I like that. It's empowering to the person to just like, I can be on a podcast and it's not like, again, like your siblings that they're like, this conversation is crazy. We should, no, it's like meaningful <laughs> and like, you know what I mean? It's not meaningful, but it's a different type of conversation. <laughs> um, so I think that's where we kind of fit in. And I think other people hearing these normal everyday stories empowers them and it makes them feel like dude my story is interesting too 
You know, or maybe every episode focuses on someone who has an interesting jo job or hobby and things like that. Maybe they'll be like, maybe I should try this thing out too. It sounds cool. Like, they like it. Maybe I'll do it, like, kind of thing. Um, yeah, and I don't really, honestly, I became the host of mine by chance, I guess, because no. there were, like, three other Latinas who were, like, down to do it, and ultimately, you know, I was the one that they selected. But I've gotten a lot of good feedback that I'm really good at doing it, you and are. I'm like, I don't know why, I just love to talk. And you already, <laughs> as you can tell, I love talking. You already said, though, that one of the values of you being the host of this show is that when you sit across from the person who you're interviewing, there is some common ground that makes you both go like, I need a look, we're the same, you're so cute. The only thing about us the same is that we're like, Our we're, Latina. yeah, literally yeah. Latinas, and we're both here right now. Yeah. But, it's incredible. I've it's enough. It a is woman enough. who is first generation, you know, Dominican, lives in New York, and she's a professional dancer. I think I was born without the bone to dance. I cannot dance. Um, just, and I have nothing in common with this woman, but we found commonality in just our existence. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool, and I really like that. Yeah, me too. I love that. What about you, Devin? Um, I think that I have, like, an natural kind of knack for I meet women and I become friends with them and then I kind of like just happen to like inspire them or motivate them <laughs> she's told me that I've had like three or four friends tell me that and I'm like oh but I was just sharing I was just trying to help you like you're amazing you're beautiful you're so creative go do it like please like I'll help you oh, basically I yeah yeah <laughs> And I am, I'm the doer, so I they're like, it. I have an idea. I'm like, well, we're, this is the plan, we're gonna do this, you need that, we're gonna do this. And they're like, okay, wait, wait, that was just an idea. I'm like, well, don't talk to me about ideas or we're not gonna do it. <laughs> because I'm gonna make sure you're gonna do it and I'm like your accountability partner. Um, and so like, and I've done that with friends and other young ladies, and so I guess I wanted to amplify that um, and be that benefit and help more women like see themselves, believe in themselves that. and like go for it. I love that. And not all women are like that. Not all women are like that. Not all Latinas are like that. So to have each other be that for each, just like in this space, like to know that we're all here for each other, that feels, that makes me feel stronger m meeting women like that. So that, that is powerful. I love that. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was just kind of, you know, she, Diamond took me under the wing and, <laughs> you know, she saw my true potential. And it also helped that my husband is an awesome videographer and he's got a very creative mind. Um, so Diamond also kind of got nudged him to start his video production, Vibe Media. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> she's a doer. Um, and she definitely sees the power that, you know, that everybody here in this room has and the value that you have. And, you know, that right there was like, it opened my eyes to see like, yeah, we're all, we all have, we're all worthy. We all, you know, have um, a story to tell. And so for me, it was just like, well, you know, let's just do this and see where it goes. I mean, we just did it for fun. And the value was just to show like, hey, we can be amigas and we can have fun. And that's another thing, too. I feel like a lot of times in the Latino community, you know, it's always about like chismes and gossip and, you know, I gaze on they're, they're laughing knowingly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's always like, you know, just to, you know, bad mouth other people or look what she's wearing, look what she's doing. And we didn't want to, I, didn't, I, I saw her and she was always about doing and you know, starting businesses and seeing the value of people. And I'm like, wow, like, I really love that. You know, that's what I've always wanted for. And I always, I told her one day, I'm like, I manifested Diamond, you know, because, <laughs> you know, because I wanted something different. I didn't want to be caught up in the whole cheese miss and just the negativity. You know, I wanted something different. And, you know, starting to realize, like, living in the present, living in the now, that's all that matters. And, you know, that's why I'm like, let's just you know, put this out there and see where it goes. And I was laughing because of the cheese man. We were brainstorming <laughs> titles for our podcast because she started this. She's like, I need a co-host for my organizational podcast. I'm like, okay, I'll be your co-host. Thinking I'm just going to come in and talk and like support and help. And then she's like, I think it needs to be a life podcast, lifestyle podcast. I'm like, okay. And then we started talking and then we're like, okay, now it's a Latina. It's about Latinas and moms. And then we're brainstorming with her husband. And one of the titles we were thinking about had cheese man in it. Yeah. <laughs> it went, well, was it? Cheese uh, mozas. <laughs> cheese mozas. I'm like, but we're not being cheese mozas. He remembers too. He, he remembers. Because it was his idea. He has it in his head. Oh. <laughs> it was his idea. <laughs> but I'm like, 
Yeah, but we're not chismeando. We're trying to, you know, get elevate ourselves yeah. and our friends. And <laughs> yeah, and like I said, I think a lot of it was too. Is like I saw all the people, all her, the, all her friends, and you know, they all were starting their businesses or they were starting to do things, and I'm like, wow. You know, like I want that. I want a group of friends who want to elevate themselves and be better and, you know, heal and just grow and not just be down here and, you know, be like, oh, well, you figure it out or, you know, just basically suffer. Like, for what? And again, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's great, you know, to see these perspectives elevated because we only know what we know. You know, we only, we only can do as much as we've seen and then everything else is either going way outside of your... Um, lived experience and outside of your comfort zone to try to, to do something else that's really, really hard. We rely on each other, on our communities, on our family. So, so having these perspectives elevated so that you see that if you do want to try something else that isn't familiar, that isn't a shared experience from anyone in your circle, that you can and you won't be alone in that. I mean, I, I think that that's, that's really important to us, to all of us, to get to feel like we have a community that is trying something um, that isn't what necessarily you have always done, what anyone around you has taught you, or what you want to keep doing. Like trying things, I think, is one of the most beautiful things that Latinas have seen so much success in coming into so many spaces where we have no idea what we're doing. The first one of our kind being there, doing it, crushing it. And a lot of it is we're just out here like trying our best doing this thing for the very first time in, in my family. That's 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 a real testament to how resilient we are and how willing we are to like to learn and to try. Yeah, and then I love that. And I love turning it around and being like, okay, I already did it. These are all the things I did wrong. Or this is everything I've learned. So I'm going to give you all the advice so you're like 10 steps ahead and you can go further. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I've been told that I'm good at it. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think the reason for that is because I'm genuinely interested in the story that the person has to tell. I'm not just waiting for my turn to talk. And, and like you hear an interview, whether it's radio, TV, podcast, whatever, a, a really bad interview is when the interviewer just won't shut up, right? Or you can tell that they're, they're just waiting so that they can ask the next question. And I don't, I don't come into an interview with prepared questions. I genuinely want to learn about this person. And what? that's just... <laughs> This is a different situation, <laughs> but I think that's what makes for great content. If, if you're doing an interview yeah. style thing is you have to genuinely be interested in your subject, right? And so, and that's just how I am. Like I walk down the street and I think, I see somebody standing on the corner and I think, I wonder where they're going. I wonder where they came from. Oh what are they watching. doing tomorrow? Like, I, that's what, I th what I'm thinking about when I'm driving down the street. Like, other people, I don't know what they think about, but I see people. I'm like, I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what it is. And I, and I think that's why, you know, almost every guest I've ever had on the show is like, wow, you're really good at doing an interview. I felt so comfortable. Um, it's because I, I'm genuinely interested in what they're doing. And I think that's how you, you create a connection that's real when you're generally interested in that person. And so... I think that's what makes me good at being a host of a podcast is I care. I ask good questions because I actually want to know the answer. And I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, and what's been special for me coming to the radio side and hosting, coming from a news background, it, it's dr driven into your head. Like, it's not about you. You're not in the story. Don't put your voice in the story. Don't, you know, don't cover things that are going to be too close to you. If there's a bias, you can't cover it. Um, your experience with it doesn't make you a better um, more equipped reporter to tell the story, your proximity to it makes you risky. It means that you'll have too many emotions. It means that you'll care too much. Maybe it's gonna mean that you're giving too much sensitivity to a subject because you have a personal history with it or you have proximity to it. In this case, even though that is like the opposite. That is so annoying. It is the opposite of like white what- men cover everything. You know? <laughs> That's you a, know what I mean? That's like, a different like panel. white men are covering Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> that's Look. what we're going to target later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We're going to target. Well, you're right. But we have a panel with you so we can have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, I just, I'm going to just put that away for next time. Because that is a different panel. Look, if they, if they, if they disqualified white men from covering things that they had proximity to, like we Congress. would all have jobs. Uh -huh covering everything because that's everything okay so it is it is thank you it is 
it's not a, a it's not a good disqualifier. It's it's a it's a bad way of doing it. But I will say that sitting in this in this seat now as host and on a race and identity show like Code Switch, it's been interesting also to and I'm hearing all of you say it in different ways. It's been interesting to feel like my own experiences have been legitimized in my in my own mind. Like there's value in talking. I'll say things that are really passing that I'll have people be like, sorry, so so what again? What about your family? Where did you come from? What what are y'all doing? Who did what in your family? And and for you, it is your lived experience. It is almost something that you you code switch about. Like I don't bring those things to job interviews. I don't talk. Those not those aren't things that make me better. The triumph and, and having to to struggle and and all the things that I've had to overcome or my family has had to overcome. That is not something like you necessarily lead with. In some rooms, it's like wow, you know, you're really you persevered. But in others, you're like I'm not trying to like highlight the things that I don't have. I'm trying to show you like the ways that I fit in or the things that help me belong. The ways that I've overcome all those spaces that I was in. It's not something that you use to be like no no. This is this is the value of me being in the room is everywhere I've been and all the people I know and every single thing that I've gone through and all the ways that I understand which rocks to turn over, which questions to ask. It's not because I'm conjecturing. I was there. That's the question I would want somebody to ask me if we were doing this story. That's the value of my voice in the room. That's the value of my perspective. And it's, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful to watch myself even just feel that level of like, oh, wow, these stories matter. And I don't know if they're anybody else's stories, but maybe they're something similar. And it, that is that's just lovely to watch all of you get to also like be in that position of you said it earlier you know i don't know how i see my power or a, you know that that latino women especially right it is just it's the name of the game right this is what this is what we do we overcome we get it done there are no options it's not a title it's just like how you exist in the world there there isn't a medal for it you don't get paid you don't get nearly enough credit this is just like the bottom line what you're going to have to do to keep the family alive and the lights on and that is power and i think even just naming that and talking about that helps to legitimize like where we all are in the spaces that we're in it helps to feel seen while you're scrubbing the counter and just being like i'm a boss <laughs> and if we don't like talk about that or we're not in these spaces reminding each other like these little stories these little things that we do these little things that we take for for granted a little bit like we take ourselves for granted it's nice to be in these spaces reminding each other like every single thing that we do every single thing we overcome being where we are today each of you in these seats and each of us in these seats that it's a miracle if you look back on your family line and see what we have all had to come through just to get in this room and sit in these seats it's beautiful and it's amazing and it is so powerful to see that there are more of us in these seats telling these stories and empowering each other in the world of, of podcasting and on our shows Okay. If I may, Lori, before you go on, I think it's also for us a really good practice to get into of pointing that out at each other. Yes, absolutely. Because we don't always see ourselves, but then we can say, hey, friend, you take amazing, beautiful pictures, like you should be an influencer. Or, <laughs> you know what it is? Or like the littlest things that they don't even see in themselves that you appreciate, you should definitely tell whoever it is, even if it's a stranger. I have a brother-in-law who's a teacher. He's a middle school teacher. And it's very important to tell your friends and other people that you're proud of them. Mm -hmm. But then he turns to me and he's like, I'm proud of you, but what's important is that you're proud of yourself. Oh. And I was like, don't make me cry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and it's both are very important. And it's very important that you tell yourself. Yes. And affirmations and believing myself. it in yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Look at them. They're already like up here, like just encouraging each other. Go, girl. <laughs> we forgot about you guys. We're friends. We're here. We're here. Yeah. So we only have a few more minutes. Um, I want to know what uh, this audience can do to help support your shows, the work that you're doing, these platforms. They require the support of consistent listen listenership and audience engagement, right? So how can Latinas hear, Latinas listening, Latinas just in general, support your show but also check your your work and 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 check the voice and check the perspective and make sure that you know what you're putting out there also has you know real real eyes and ears on it in a way to both consume it and support you but also but also be you know behind you checking you the way we are so good at doing <laughs> <laughs> um i'm very lucky that at cpr we don't emphasize the numbers on mm. streaming which is very surprising even to me um 
but that's not to say we don't want to reach the right audience. Yeah. I think that's why part of the reason that the numbers don't matter to us at CPR, at least for my show, I don't know about the other shows, is because we are trying to reach an audience we don't reach now. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, we can't expect these huge numbers if they don't know that we exist because mm -hmm. we haven't done the work to get to them. Yeah. Um, and this is part of our effort to better ourselves. You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you want to listen, wherever you get your podcast, Kien Are We? I thought of the name. <laughs> And uh, if you know anyone who's like even kind of interesting, they don't have to be the most interesting person. If you know how to interview a person the right way, they're very interesting. Um, yeah, you can just email me or hit me up on Twitter. Rachel, something. we need the, the registration list for just everyone in the audience. <laughs> and then you're going to have many, many seasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in production for season two right now. We're doing uh, background interviews and I'm very excited because it's going to be Far more, far more diverse than the first one, which I'm very Amazing. excited about. We're actually tackling queer issues this season as well, awesome. which we did not get to do the first season. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it'll be, it'll be great. Bravo, me. Thank Love you. Love that. Simon? I think we're the same. We're not worried about our numbers. We're really doing this to help you. And so we actually created a PDF workbook. So if you go to our Instagram, Modern Latina Living, um, in our link, you'll see the vision board workbook. Um, and it's free. It's a, one of our newest products. And if you register for it, we actually have 15 free t-shirts. So if you're one of the first 15, we're going to give you a free t-shirt today. Ah! Modern Latina Living. Was this uh, your idea to do this? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> see, did you it. see my door? Yes, you're did good. You see you're it? good. Very good. <laughs> But we really just want to help you and inspire you. And this vision board workbook is something that I've done and I've shared with my friends. Um, has been very powerful and it's transformed my life. Like a lot of the things I put on a vision board have come true. Um, and so we just want to empower you. We want you to take the power that you have and change your life to whatever you want it to be. Right. Um, so I created, I think it's like 30 pages, a 30 page That's workbook awesome. um, for you to, to write down your goal, your dreams, your affirmations and go for it. Do it. Yeah. I'm like, Mikey, do it. <laughs> we do have a, uh, um, what episode was that, where we kind of, we did a, a self-evaluation of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think it was like three. Like episode three. We have seven episodes. So it was about like the whole long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that in the podcasting space, only like... It's I like think 70, we were listening 70, to your yeah, podcast that when you said of that. Podcasters never get past episode five. Yeah, and I'm all like, aren't we on <laughs> seven? <laughs> so you're killing, you're killing it at number yeah. seven. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Check us out. We're anywhere, anywhere we listen to your podcast at Modern Latina Living. We're on Instagram. We have website, Facebook, Just, YouTube. So check us out. Oh yeah, we do video YouTube, so you can see oh, our pretty faces. Yeah. There's our and. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, so yeah, you could uh, listen to us in the car, um, or you can just watch us on YouTube. So, love it. <laughs> I'd say broadly, if you want to support podcasting, then listen to podcasts. That's yeah. really what it takes. Podcaster, podcasting as a whole has what's called a discovery problem, which means that there is a listenership problem sort of plateaued. And the way to, for podcasters, especially independent podcasters, to grow their platforms is to get more listeners. And the way that you support those independent podcasts in particular is do what they're asking you to do. If it's download a PDF, download the PDF. If it's join their Patreon, join their Patreon. Please keep in mind that independent podcasters, when you listen to that show, so I'm talking about somebody who's like not on the Wondery Network, they're not an Amazon show or one of those big names, the host of that show is doing everything, yeah. everything. They're doing the recording, they're doing the editing, they're doing the uploading, they're doing the social media, the marketing. Making the t-shirts. Making the t-shirts. <laughs> they're figuring it out, right? They're figuring out and they have to figure out how do we fund this platform so that we can continue to do it. So I would say support independent podcasts is the best way that you can support podcasting as a whole. That might be. If you're a podcaster, or you're thinking about becoming a podcaster, you can always join BIPOC Podcast Creators. It's free for creators to join. You just go to our website, BIPOCpodcastcreators.com, get on the mailing list. You can join the Facebook group. All of that's free. And then if you happen to be in Denver on August 25th, we are doing, uh, we do audio flavor socials. So it's an in-person networking event for new and middle of the road podcasters to come and connect. It's fun. We have DJs, we have food. We have giveaways. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be here in Denver. So, <laughs> so join us there on August 25th.
And y'all can come hang out with me on Code Switch, anywhere you get your podcast, anytime. I would love all the feedback that y'all can give. I desperately want to grow the Latino audience and the Latino focus for NPR. Um, so yeah, y'all y'all write me anytime um, that you you know want to hear a story or a perspective about literally anything. I'm listening to you, and I definitely want to keep uplifting our voices at NPR and. All of these women are doing that in their spaces. <laughs> so let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all, thank you all, thank you all so much. Take a picture, scan the QR codes so you can get each of our shows at each one of those QR codes. And thank you all so much for letting us be here to talk with you today. This was so much fun. <laughs>